have been implemented, incorporated in the global south. But the interesting uh, parallel development is that that comes alongside judicial review mechanisms, right? Because at least in Latin America until uh, the early 1990s, we had this generous proclamations of rights without uh, any implementation mechanism, without any type of judicial action to enforce those rights. So it is that the combination of those two that makes for the type of cases that Everaldo uh, and Manuel discussed in the previous uh, panel. So what I'm going to do today is take a look at, and this is based on a paper that I published in the Texas Law Review, <coughs> try, to, try and bring together two different uh, traditions. And here I use this scale, this is from the cover of, of a, a book that I did with a colleague of mine on the IDP case uh, handed down by the, the ruling by the Constitutional Court that I'm going to describe in a moment that they rather already touched upon. Uh, and the, the left side of, of the scale here it has been uh, more cultivated, it, it is more common in Latin American scholarship, meaning the uh, theoretical work and the doctrinal work on how to justify the justiciability of social economic rights, and also uh, how to uh, treat, how to develop interest legal doctrines, constitutional doctrines, that protect socioeconomic rights in different countries throughout Latin America. And that's the job of most of constitutional lawyers, uh, at least in, in our region. But then on the other hand, uh, what I'm interested in, and this is where all the traditional law society scholarship and the work that many of uh, many people in the room here have done, is an equally important focus on enforcement and governance. And that's for reason. That's for reason. That's been uh, been going on for uh, about five years only. Meaning that uh, only recently have Latin American scholars and other scholars in the global south paid systematic attention to what happens after the uh, court hands down. And I'm going to focus completely on this side of the equation, precisely because of that, that unbalanced picture that uh, we had, at least in the Latin American context, to try to balance out uh, this image. What I do in the paper is a comparative case study. My methodology is basically a comparative constitutional ethnography. I did what I did in one of them with a colleague of mine. Again, this fancy uh, names for the uh, rulings. This is the decision T25 of 2004. This is uh, the largest case, the largest structural injunction case that the uh, Colombian Constitutional Court has uh, delivered, probably the most ambitious uh, intervention in public policy in Latin America from any constitutional court. It's an open case. It's been going on for almost 10 years now. It tries to deal with the fact that with the actual humanitarian emergency, uh, because Colombia and how this is the, the, uh, the, the, the champion, so it is uh, an honor to be champion in this, of internally displacement, the internally displacement uh, because of uh, the civil war going on still in Colombia. So we have between four and five million people who have been forcibly displaced from their homes. And, and what the court did pretty much along the lines of the healthcare rights uh, litigation was um, to put a stop to uh, the flood of individual cases uh, coming from individual plaintiffs, families who go to the courts and say, well, I'm here from, uh, I'm right in Bogota all the way from the Caribbean coast. I have nowhere to stay. And according to the Constitution, I have right to house. So I need you to redress the situation. And the courts would uh, respond favorably but on a case by case basis until uh, eventually, in 2004, the Constitutional Court grouped together around a thousand cases like this and handed down a structural injunction in ground injunction uh, rule uh, that set, uh, that, uh, set uh, out to change the situation through a number of orders that I'm going to describe in a moment. The second uh, ruling, I won't say anything because Sayo Ebraldo made my job easy, is uh, the one on healthcare from 2008. And the third one is actually the, the oldest one. It's on prisoners' rights. Pretty much, and I won't say much about that because when we're in California, you know we're talking about prison, but it's very similar to the structural injunction prison case of the California <coughs> Supreme Court. Uh, what I did in my study was try to look at the different practice key variables that explain the different impact of these three <coughs> cases, of these three structural rulings, and try to come up with some ideas on how a court, in this 
ambitious, complex cases can uh, enhance its positive impact on the protection of social economy. And, and the goal was twofold. One was more analytical in nature, was interested in trying to highlight the fact that these cases have a whole host of effects that go well beyond uh, the material immediate effects. Uh, and I'll say what I mean by that in a moment. But I wanted to, because uh, there's a discussion on these issues, whether you are for or against this type of intervention, uh, normally narrows down to whether the court, uh, whether, whether the government complied with the specific ruling, whether the, the patients got the medicines that they wanted, whether the prisoners are now in better prison conditions, and so on and so forth. But I argue that this, uh, the, the, these cases actually serve larger purposes that are key to take into account in any social legal assessment of the impact of education. And the second one is, as I said, it's more explanatory in nature, trying to get at the key variables that explain why some cases are, are more consequential than others, have more consequences than others. Uh, and then, since we have limited time, I'll just give you a flavor uh, of the first part of, uh, of the paper, and I'll focus on the second half. And uh, in terms of the effects of really what I do is, what I wanted to do was, this is, these are figures from uh, the budget that the Colombian government has spent on IDP, internally displaced people's policies, between 1999 and 2010. And remind, remember that the court case, uh, the court ruling was handed down in 2004. So this is a clear direct effect of multiplication by, by a factor of 10, actually of the amount of money that got invested, spent on IDP policy. Okay? Directly as a result of the court's intervention. Uh, so this is easy to see even in a, in a quick slide. But there are some other uh, outcomes, other effects, that are hard to measure, right? That require more qualitative research, uh, but that are, uh, to my mind, I look equally important. So these are paper, uh, newspaper clipping, clippings uh, from uh, a newspaper that's covering, in this case, uh, the plight of indigenous people who have been forcibly displaced from their lands. Right? So I wanted to capture both the budgetary impact, but also the more symbolic uh, public opinion uh, effect of the movie. And what we did, for example, in this particular case with my colleague, was uh, do a content analysis of the uh, issue of displacement, from the forced displacement. <coughs> and measure how the media, the main media outlets, talked about um, uh, internal, internal space. And we found that before 2004, internal space uh, would be covered, used to be covered as a side effect of the civil war. And after 2004, you see slowly but surely uh, a process of legalization of the language of the media. Quickly talking about it until today, the Constitutional Court, as an actor, gets quoted virtually every time there's a discussion on internal displacement in the media. And the language of rights, the language of uh, reparations, is the dominant thing. And for those of you, and you guys are all here or have been uh, students at Spills who are taking class in Spills, so I will go through this very quickly because you will get the picture immediately. Uh, when I teach this, uh, give this talk at regular uh, LLM programs, I take out uh, this, I spend most of the time explaining what this is. But uh, of course I wanted to, uh, that means that I want to get at direct and indirect effects of the rulings, but also at material and symbolic effects, and I take this from uh, Michael McCann's work. Go through this very quickly, I'd be happy to take questions about this, but I, I want to uh, get to the second point. Uh, so by material and direct effects of these structural cases, I mean the type of um, measures and impacts that I uh, try to depict with the uh, slide on the budgetary uh, increase. Right? The design of public policy in this particular case, the government, the Colombian government, had to come up with a coherent policy, <coughs> actually a legislation, proposed legislation, that was passed in Congress. Um, but also, uh, the, the ruling structural ruling has had uh, direct symbolic effects, in that as a result of, of the court, continuing to press uh, to pressure the government to do something about it, to, uh, by convening, for example, more over 30 public hearings up until now, by uh, issuing more than 100 uh, follow-up orders, 
has changed the conversation and has redefined the problem, has helped redefine the problem of internal displacement as a human rights problem. Um, and the uh, final um, effect that I want to highlight is an indirect material effect. This, this, this is interesting. What's happened, and I uh, alluded to this, what happened as a result of this uh, structural injunction uh, ruling was that the civil society organizations, academic centers, social legal scholars, constitutional lawyers came together and actually established a follow-up uh, commission. Right? That's been a key actor. It, it, it was not for a point. They organized themselves, but in the end have uh, ended up being the key technical interlocutor to the court and have, been, have played an instrumental role in the implementation of the ruling. And of course, the, the court never saw this coming. It never, it, it, it was criminal in nature, right? So they said, well, let's, let's hand on this case, and people organized themselves and came up with this. And this is why I'm inter uh, really here. And finally, as you, of course, get away from this quadrant, it gets more and more um, big and harder to measure. Uh, and this, actually, I haven't been able to, to track down. One can, because one could, if we had been able to take service before the 2004 ruling and after the 2004, it would have been interesting to see whether the public opinion approach changed uh, in the same way, the same direction as the media coverage. Okay, so let me go quickly through uh, the, my argument on India. I take this from uh, Mark Duchman's work, at least the two key variables, and argue that there are two things that matter for these structural induction cases to, uh, to uh, make a difference, to um, create these effects. One is the content of the rights. Remember, Mark Tuchman's book on uh, weak, uh, strong rights with weak remedies? That's, that's, it. that's it. Yeah, the idea is that uh, whether or not a court asserts strong content of the right matters. Right? For example, the South African Constitutional Court has been much, uh, more, much uh, uh, less assertive in terms of uh, defining the right to housing, for instance, under the colonial constitutional court. And that may uh, make a difference in practice. Um, second, of course, remedies. What type of remedies, what type of orders, the court uh, hands, hands down. And this is as far as uh, Tashman goes. Uh, but I argue that it's key also to look at the monitoring process. Right? So it's a combination of content, remedies, and monitoring. That matters, and, and how does that matter? This is the last bit. My presentation, and as I, as uh, Diego said, I was trained as a sociologist, so I can't help coming up with the two by two tables. And this case is like an overblown four by three table. This is my advice would be change, but anyway. Okay. And my argument is that uh, um, let me back up. Uh, drawing on on. Um, uh, say and Simon's work and uh, the literature on experimentalism and also the Latin American literature on dialogic, what we call dialogic activism, judicial activism. What I argue is that the, those uh, orders and their rulings that end up being more efficacious are those that combine, that have a combination that we can see in the IEP case, meaning strong rights, Moderate remedies is that they're open-ended, they're process-oriented, right? The, the court never said in this particular case, uh, they were told the government to invest a given amount of money, specific amount of money, but it rather told the government to come up with a budget. That it itself, the government through its uh, finance minister, uh, being appropriate to deal with the scale of the problem. Um, it never told the government exactly what to do, but it rather told the well, you have to have a policy. I will tell you what type of policy, specifically the details of that policy, but you have to come up with a coherent plan that we can um, faithfully call a policy. Uh, but then it's followed, it's um, persisted in the monitoring effort for 10 years now. So, uh, as I mentioned, we've had over 30 public hearings in which, very much like in, in the Rivaldo's picture, the court. Um, brings together government officials, uh, civil society organizations, IDP uh, representatives, uh, some representatives from the international community, from the UN and other agencies, uh, and uh, makes the government accountable and the media covers all. 
and, and this has been going on for 40 years, not like, well, for 10 years now, I've probably been doing that for 40 years, but, uh, but it is true that there is no closure uh, inside, which I think is a problem as well. And the, the um, outcome, and I can tell you how I measure in, in fact that I'm going to that because I'm coming out time, is high as compared to the other. Now, Bernardo's uh, case in healthcare rights has this combination. It also asserts strong rights. It also has moderate uh, remedies, uh, like you have explained. But then the court has been unable to do the kind of monitoring that is done on the IPK for the reasons that also even I understand. And the fact uh, in this particular um, arrangement of, of sample of cases is moderate. And finally, this is the healthcare you're talking about? Yes, the, the second one, healthcare. And the third one is the prisoner's one, right? the, uh, the one on prison overcrowding. And this particular case it was the first case in which the court uh, attempted to do this type of intervention, right? So what it did was do the same, uh, assert that uh, the prisoners have specific rights that need to be protected, uh, but then, interestingly, and, uh, and the government and the court could later learn from this lesson, uh, try to uh, determine every detail of the policy and, and of the uh, decisions that the government would have to make in order to redress, to uh, uh, solve the prison over crime uh, uh, For instance, it went as far as saying that you had to construct an, an X number of jails and to devote an X number of dollars or pests uh, to this particular um, uh, problem. And finally, but it is better at that. Uh, the court thought that by being assertive, the government would so basically automatically come back. And this has led to a very low level of implementation. And I think I've run out of time, so I'll leave it at that. I'll be happy to entertain for any questions in the hearing. Thank you. comes from a, a book that's coming out in the next month or two on, on called Symbols and Substance, uh, so second in South Africa. Uh, this presentation is also uh, based on some broader work on judicial review and, and, and its critics. But moving uh, straight along, so South Africa is perhaps the archetype, archetype uh, by excellence uh, when it comes to socioeconomic rights. It's referred to constantly in many different areas. So, Firstly, the Constitution. Um, so the, the first Constitution in English to very specifically set out a range of socio-economic rights and make them just as simple. And even though this was happening in Eastern Europe, Latin America, all the scholars in the world who only speak English, of course, only knew about South Africa, and therefore it's uh, <laughs> dominating. Um, I actually edited a book on social rights jurisprudence, covered 33 jurisdictions, and the one sentence I had to delete from almost every chapter was, my jurisdiction has the leading low, 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 low. So, you know, it's amazing that people, you just do study one jurisdiction and you think it's the, you know, the, the most special one. But anyway, it's got a lot of attention. But also because in uh, one of its major judgments, Brooklyn judgment, the Constitutional Court, in, in, in a very eloquent and well-written judgment, set out a framework for making these rights just as simple. Uh, articulating so that the, the, the negative aspects of the rights um, were protected, but also the positive dimensions, and there was this obligation of reasonableness. And they specify in some detail the sort of criteria of this uh, duty while, by, while being sensitive to sort of democratic and concerns. And that was in 2000. And then you also have uh, mobilization around socioeconomic rights and legal mobilization around socioeconomic rights. And you have the, the, the uh, one of the, the, the leading cases, Treatment Action Campaign, which uh, shortly after the campaign against the Battle of Seattle, they used the same sort of global strategy. You know, emails were flying around the world, 
uh, as, as this campaign mobilised support uh, to, uh, against the President's denialism of HIV AIDS and restrictions on antiretroviral medicines and medicines to protect the mothers from transmitting HIV to their, to their children. Um, but it also went to court and it uh, kind of followed up judgment to hook on the treatment action decision, which showed, basically facilitated the, the, um, the, the, the programs for these uh, medicines. And the other aspect is, is some of its social reforms. You had a raft of legislation in the 90s, which was to a certain extent socio-economic rights based, particularly the Water Services Act and the Prevention of Illegal Addictions Act. So really taking socio-economic rights seriously, integrating ideas around rights in the legislation uh, in a direct way. In areas like social security uh, and education, we saw massive uh, uh, allocation, sometimes in response to litigation, sometimes not. But certainly much more than many other middle income countries So it becomes this, this positive archetype. At the same time, you can also find it as the negative archetype. Everything that's wrong with socioeconomic rights. Um, so people will list all the negative uh, socioeconomic uh, indicators when it comes to um, the human development index. You know, South Africa tumbled down uh, you know, to, to over 100, partly because of HIV, but partly because of a failure to address uh, poverty and inequality in, in, in a deeper way. Uh, I'm just showing you the unemployment uh, statistics. Uh, so there's very few countries with unemployment at this level, uh, where the official unemployment rate got up to 30%, and the informal is getting over 40%. 40, 40%. Uh, so you have massive structural issues, you have very high levels of poverty. <coughs> uh, income inequality has not shifted much since 1994, and then the transition from apartheid. Um, but you also have an expansion of intra-class uh, or interracial uh, inequality, so uh, as well as a continuation of inequality uh, across across races. So, and some people would say this is not just a problem with the transition from from apartheid, not just a problem with the ANC and its politics, but it's also a problem with socio-economic rights in the United States general. So you get a leftist critique. Um, which says that you know rights are basically uh, an empty uh, sort of hollow hope. Um, it's not about just asking things from the state. You need a militancy. Uh, you need to actively uh, demand rights, create rights, uh, and, and, and fight for them. And that, uh, you too easily um, <coughs> play into the hands of passive institutions um, when you take a rights based approach. Then you have more right right wing critique that. That uh, citizens become more disengaged, uh, more slovenly when they start to, to claim rights. You know. <clears throat> so the whole approach of the post apartheid government was to deliver free housing, free this, free the other, is led to a disengaged citizenry. The people's expectations are not met. They revert to the anti apartheid mode of protest, which is destroyed, don't pay, trash. Now, South Africa I mean, leads many statistics. One, one of them is apparently the rate of protest in the world. Um, so that could be a good thing, but according to this critic, it's, it's a bad thing. Uh, we have service delivery protests, uh, thousands and thousands uh, every year. And relevant for today is a critique of courts. And there's two different types of critiques, and I'll focus more on the second one. But the, the first one is um, kind of more a critical legal studies uh, uh, critique. That the court has sort of depoliticized socioeconomic rights. You can certainly say for the court when it comes to, say, the more, I hesitate to call them negative obligations, but more when it deals with, say, interferences like evictions. The court has developed probably the, the leading jurisprudence of the world on, on forced evictions. A jurisprudence that could, could help many in this country when it came to foreclosures after the global financial crisis. Incredible pr protections uh, against both the state, against banks, against landlords, and really uh, taking the, the pr protection of forced evictions seriously within the Constitution. And in many ways, giving, uh, creating positive duties in terms of alternative accommodation, duties of negotiation, uh, and, and duties of uh, municipalities to pay compensation to property owners if they had occupiers on their farm, for example, and they could not. not, not be. So, but when it came to positive obligations, the court has tended to take, be, take a much more cautious approach and had this reasonableness test, which already suggests a lot of discretion. And the question was, was it going to be a substantive uh, reasonableness test or a more thinner proceduralized one? <clears throat> In quite a number of cases, the court has tended towards a more proceduralized version of reasonableness, 
and to some extent transform constitutional law into administrative law. Um, so that's one critique. Uh, the second is, well, what about the impact? What about compliance? And so if Brookborn comes back, the leading case on uh, justiciability uh, then becomes the, the, the leading exhibit for uh, everything that's wrong uh, about the effects of social rights litigation. And often it was said, look, Mrs. Brookborn died without, without a house. Okay? Uh, and the community didn't get housing. And there's also a general issue about compliance with, 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 uh, with orders beyond that particular case. So, the, the book that I mentioned basically tries to get at these questions, although we ask not just about court-based strategies, we're also interested in non-court-based strategies. And when, when people, the civil society actors use an increased in strategic resources, also from the class. Ask what's been the impacts and what lessons we, we can draw. So, let's just take a number of these judgments for the, for the current case. It's been you know, around the world leading socioeconomic rights judgments in the court. You don't have the individual to tell actions that you have in Colombia, Brazil, Costa Rica. Everything is precedent based. So, um, you tend to get fewer judgments, and the court doesn't like to write many judgments each year. Um, I wanted to take three of these and ask what has been the impact, because then perhaps more the hard cases, because the Brookborn case uh, was presumed to have no impact, and, and take the Mazabuco case, which actually lost in the constitutional court on more grounds when compared to Joseph. So I'm thinking about uh, uh, impact. Um, I'm not going to spend much time on that. Uh, but obviously we'll take a holistic approach, a bit like Caesar. It says, uh, obviously the big question is, do you take a before and after approach, or do you take an idealist expectations uh, uh, approach? Um, and that can really determine your views on, on impact. Um, so you've got, you know, say Malcolm Feely taking before and after uh, uh, approach on, on prison reform litigation, so lots of impact. And Gerald Rosenberg taking ideas and expectations on Brown versus Board of Education, no impact. Um, what I try and do in the group form study is, is, is a bit of both. Um, obviously, we're very alive to causality questions, constraints, and you know, asking what, what are the conditions for impact. So let's take the group form uh, case. As probably many of you will know, this is a, a, a community which had been evicted three times just near Cape Town. It ended up on the edge of a sports field. And the community went to court after political negotiations had failed and asked for, for housing. The court gave the, the judgment, which found that South African housing policy was not reasonable uh, because there was no program in place for those who were in desperate need. There was also a settlement order that gave the community the right to some basic shelter uh, which they could erect on, on this course. What was the impact? Well, I've divided, I've done a, a two by three there. Um, so I started with Cesar's uh, uh, matrix, but I found it too sociological. Uh, so I'm, I'm more and more biased towards political science. And I think you've got to, and I think if anything, law, law is about politics, it's about changing it affects power relationships, um, destabilizes uh, power relationships, affects buildings there. Um, so I've just divided it in that way. And the interesting is to how many impacts one actually can find when one has a 10 year period of analysis and goes back and does the research. What I found in the literature is that everybody had cited a 2005 newspaper article and a 2008 newspaper article. And in the case of the 2008 newspaper article, most scholars have not even read the entire article. Um, and I'll get to that in a moment. So, what does the community get? Well, they got building materials and services. And, you know, it wasn't great, but it actually protected them to some extent from the elements. They got some water and, to some extent, sanitation. Importantly, they were protected from eviction. They have been evicted three times in a year or two up to then. The eviction stopped. Now, there was no court order for permanent housing for this community because there were two billion people waiting in the country for housing. So the court was very cautious about ordering a housing for them. So many of the critics sort of ignore the actual court decision. But the fact is that the, the litigation and the decision catalyzed the local municipality to develop a housing plan for that area. And it was deemed that they were the fourth on the list in terms of priority. There are actually other communities in more desperate need who needed access to permanent housing. 
And by 2007 to 2009, it actually started to get... Uh, to, to get uh, in 2005, uh, the South African government actually um, uh, implemented or actually passed an emergency housing policy, which sought to take account of the judgment. And I've called this an indirect effect because I'm looking at it from the perspective of the community rather than the, the, the judgment. Um, there's some other uh, impacts there which we could discuss. Politically, um, I think it's important to increase the leverage with the municipality. So once the litigation started properly and there was a lawyer involved, the balance of power uh, uh, began to change. Um, was a demobilisation of the community when litigation began? Did lawyers take over too much? That was an open question. Perhaps the problem with the Brookborn Community Competitive Treatment Action Campaign was that there was a limited alliance building. Um, symbolically, I didn't find that this case had much impact uh, on public opinion, on, on, on uh, discussions in the media. Um, perhaps amongst the bureaucracy and planners, there was a shift in the view of slum dwellers Toward, as rights holders. At the same time, there was securitisation discourses emerged which sought to criminalise our slum dwellers. But I then did a second thing, um, which was to say the Hookborn case began as a forced eviction case and ended up as a housing rights case. That's a similar trajectory from a whole range of cases in South Africa. And I then compared it to seven other uh, 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 cases which also started off as forced eviction cases. But then over time, developed in different ways. The courts started perhaps adding a positive obligations order, or they got it in a settlement, or there was an out-of-court settlement. And these cases take a similar trajectory to, to Brookborn. Um, if, you, if you just abstract look away a bit from the judgment and look more broadly at what is going on uh, politically with these, with these cases. And I looked at different impacts, whether it was uh, non-eviction, improved services, formal housing in a certain period, policy changes. And some of these cases had more impact on those indicators. In fact, when, when, when book boom, others had, had, had less. Um, so I think, it, again, it's, it's important how one categorizes a case and what one compares it uh, uh, to. The other, the other interesting case is uh, Mazabuka, which I don't have much time to discuss, but this case lost spectacularly in, in the Constitutional Court after winning actually in the lower courts, which are more conservative. So it was a real surprise. The, the, uh, the township had basically asked for 50 litres per person a day of water instead of 25 under the free water policy, because the free water policy was based on eight persons in a household, and many of these communities, these, these uh, homes, so up to 24 persons. They also asked for these, these automatic uh, water disconnectors uh, to be stopped. We had to know uh, sort of prepaid meters, and water would run out uh, uh, after the free allocation had, um, had gone, and people couldn't get water for the rest of the month if they used that allocation. They said this was a limitation or disconnection of water that had stated in, in the water services legislation. So the interesting thing is that Mazabuka had lost. Um, but when you compare it to another case on Joseph on the right to electricity, um, which won, you see very different impacts. So the Mazabuco case got all the, what we would say, all the things right in terms of framing a very good litigation strategy. Mobilisation, lawyers, timing, research, everything. It lost. Joseph had none of this, and in fact won in the Constitutional uh, Court. But the interesting thing is that Mazabuco has had much more impact on the ground. So all the things that the litigants asked for, they've actually got during the court case. So the policy changed. So it's basically getting up towards 50, 50 litres per day. The, the policy on, pre, uh, on prepaid meters has basically uh, shifted. They're, they're not forcibly uh, implemented. They're allowing people to basically uh, you know, remove them and, and, and so forth. So the process of legal mobilisation actually shifted the, the, the policy parameters and, and the political uh, environment. So just some general conclusions on the South African experience. It's possible to identify a range of impacts and perhaps more than we expected. There was some evidence of negative impacts. Um, we heard a little bit of discussion about this. Perhaps some of the organisational impacts of intensive litigation. So when some NGOs were really caught up in massive battles, say with Monsanto, uh, it had it actually 
completely drained this environmental organisation as to what it was really meant to, to, to do. Um, we found the symbolic impacts were, were mostly uh, uh, limited, um, perhaps because of the newspaper coverage is, is, is more limited uh, in, in South Africa, but we found material and political impacts are more, more significant. I mean, I've, I think generally it's harder to get symbolic impacts. Um, and I think Katarina Linus's recent research on the US Supreme Court shows that the Supreme Court can shift public opinion before and after a judgment, but we're talking maybe 10% of people or a shift in a bit of an opinion. It's, it's perhaps not as big as, as some of the material. Uh, Comparing litigation and non-litigation strategies, I think this is perhaps the most interesting, is that two-track strategies that combine litigation and non-litigation methods were more effective than either one alone. Um, so perhaps more consistent with uh, the Rosenberg. The exception was the circumstances when clear, there was clear political space for cooperation. Their litigation wasn't needed at all. We just messed it up. Um, we did find that there were very few instances of major transformative change to socioeconomic rights litigation. Um, you know, there were more, the litigation tended to happen within an existing policy framework that pushed it in a different direction, including this group, including this policy, but not necessarily transforming the whole policy. Treatment action campaigns, perhaps one example, in terms of ongoing litigation and engagement with the government, has really transformed at least HIV. Uh, so does this confirm the courts are constrained, that they can only, their contributions are diffuse, microcosmic and dull, as Hazard uh, would argue? Not necessarily, because we found that if you looked at the non-litigation based strategies, and then, or then go further non-rights based strategies, they had the same constraints. They, they weren't able to transform. And perhaps this is basically a more contextual issue, that South Africa is a period of implementation of existing policies. So courts feel, I think, more reluctant, bureaucrats are reluctant to really accept major transformative change. You might have to wait to really test that hypothesis. And what were the factors that drove um, uh, impact? Um, so here's a few ways to make Sergio happy. Uh, looking at four different types of variables, the, the legal variables that drove uh, impact was it the nature of the target of active defendants, was it the parameter variables, or was it some sort of legal mobilization variables? And I basically bolded those types of variables which seem significant uh, across the many case studies. And they basically mostly for what we would call the demand side, uh, for a better, for a better uh, variable label, is that the degree of legal mobilization, coalitions, alliance building in particular, not just broad mobilization, but alliances with academics, experts, uh, local NGOs, community organisation were, were very critical, as were the, the, the defendants. Um, it was easier against national governments and locals to get change, easier against public, in the public sphere rather than the private sphere. Um, there was real issues of bureaucratic contingency uh, when you were trying to affect major institutional uh, So, we sort of generally found in the case of South Africa, said, that the impact of, say, at least court, court decisions, but also other types of studies, heavily dependent on the degree of legal mobilization, or the sort of bureaucratic constituency. Um, and this is perhaps not surprising in South Africa, given the court has created a very narrow space for itself. Not only is it cautious around positive obligations, but it's been reluctant to impose supervisory remedies. So in, in, the, in the table above, we saw that a you know, follow-up remedy by a court it's important, but the court would basically usually only give you a one-shot follow-up remedy. That's it. In most cases, pretty much it. And there may be some sort of process before final judgment, the court in one case set the parties are going to negotiate. But given this limited uh, space that the court occupies, it really comes down to the degree of legal mobilization uh, and then what's happening on the other side. So it's a different story than, than Columbia. And perhaps confirms Scheingold's approach of the myth of rights, that people in South Africa dreamed of a strong, accountability-oriented and responsive court, but it seems to be, at the moment at least, elusive, perhaps it's ideal, perhaps this is the ideology. Uh, instead, rights are more, you know, there's impact when rights are deployed to promote collective political mobilization on behalf of egalitarian gender, and courts simply lend their support to, to this process. Um, 
how am I argue why this is great, the legal mobilisation story is great. It basically benefits those who can mobilise. Um, and that there is a need for a more responsive uh, court, perhaps along the, the model of, of Colombia and Argentina, that can basically make litigation uh, uh, more effective. Not even that. Specific 
and it asked the government to uh, it asked all the governments to periodically send reports on what it was doing. And so we all also have more than 500 affidavits of different parties, including the state and the central government and the NGO that approached the court. But one of the important things I argue that the court did, and this was the most important part of the of the whole petition, was that it appointed commissioners to actually monitor the implementation of these orders. So it appointed two experts um, who were in the bureaucracy before but retired, and uh, uh, they knew about the food policy and had worked on it before. It appointed two of them to sit as commissioners and basically correspond with the state governments on what they were doing with implementing the orders of the court. And these commissioners had advisors to um, to uh, assist them, as well as a host of uh, other staff who were from grassroots movement on the right to food and also other NGOs. So this was the commissioner's uh, office was essentially made up of all of these. Uh, movements that were familiar with a bottom-up approach on uh, on right of food, and this actually helped the court in uh, getting a lot of uh, orders implemented and in getting a lot of schemes, uh, government schemes implemented. So, what exactly did the court do with uh, what exactly did the court achieve, or what exactly was achieved at the end of the day? Um, with Miguel Niels, in the beginning of the case, there were two states that were implementing the midday meal scheme. And it was basically just food grains being given to the parents of the children. But the court uh, ordered that it was not food grains, but cooked food that has to be available to the children every day. And that has to be made available. And two states did that at the beginning of the case. But the commissioners uh, time and again reported on the, the status of implementation in different States and what they could possibly do. Many of the states uh, claim that they lack resources, but the commissioners challenged this. So by 2005, the Midday Meal Scheme has been implemented completely uh, uh, in all the 28 states in the whole country. So it's basically considered a success and court orders as implemented. But there is an issue on the quality of the meals that are provided. But that is now being uh, negated and the court is getting into all of that as well. Now with destitution and early child care, the court uh, directed the central government to basically double its budget and cover it. And the government did that. And um, with the dis actual food distribution, the food gain distribution though, there was not much that, that could be implemented because the court found that there were a lot of debates within uh, forces in the government that did not know how exactly to implement it. They had um, they had a lot of uh, uncertainty on who was supposed to be the beneficiaries under the scheme and how exactly the food grains had to be distributed. So the, the court built up this debate and the commissioners were key in building up this debate because the reports of the commissioners reflected all of the debates happening within different sectors of the society. And the court uh, decided that it was too complex and it referred to an expert committee and now it's gone on as a debate to the right to food bill that is now being proposed. And the, one of the commissioners is actually one of the members of uh, the committee that is drafting the bill. So it, it's actually, it's, uh, it's a process where every, where there is huge participation by different uh, sectors of the society and the court is basically monitoring how the, uh, how each uh, party participates. And with night shelters, I'll come back to this in a, in a minute. There was again partial implementation. The court uh, gave out many orders with, uh, with constructing night shelters for people who were homeless and who, had, who were likely to uh, uh, suffer death from starvation uh, more than anybody else. So um, I'll come back to how uh, the night shelters orders panned out uh, later on. And some of the social security schemes, um, the commissioners reported that many of the state governments were planning to scrap some of the schemes because they, they absolutely had no idea uh, who was in charge of implementation and what had to be done. So the court basically just directed the uh, governments to let the scheme survive. And it has been issuing directions on how to implement it with the assistance of the commissioners and the other parties who were involved uh, with, uh, in, with monitoring the implementation of the order. Now, what I'm interested in is how, in a court-controlled environment, how did um, 
the court actually ensured that there was some sort of implementation of the orders and what strategies were used to induce this implementation. And finally, what, uh, what can we say about the role of the court uh, as regards all of this in uh, furthering socioeconomic rights? So I take, um, uh, I uh, borrow from uh, someone sitting here on uh, the destabilization of um, a status quo uh, where the court plays as a forum to uh, ensure that there is accountability of a chronically underperforming institution. So uh, this is a shift away from the command and control form of regulation, where the, here the court did, did not actually uh, try to uh, force the, any of the governments into implementing any, any of the orders. For instance, in the midday meal scheme, in the first report itself, it knew that there were three problem states that were not bother to implement the order. Bihar, Jharkhand, and Uttar Pradesh did not bother replying in the first instance. And then they said, we don't have the resources, don't ask us. And they blamed it on the central government. And so there was, uh, the court knew that these uh, states were underperforming and they were not implementing, but the court did not take a, a contempt action or any action against those states. Instead, it, uh, it gave the states a leeway and another deadline, and it asked, um, it, it gave another specific target and asked the states if, if it could in, be implemented, and the commissioners played a major role in uh, sort of setting these targets. So it was a shift away from um, a command and control sort of uh, regulation to a more uh, deliberative and participative uh, form, of, uh, form of enforcement. And uh, one of the, one of the uh, strategies and one of the effects that, uh, that is noticed in uh, Simon Simon's paper as well is that in a strategy like this, the court's function increases as well as decreases. So um, the court sort of has been on this case for 10 years, some of them are tired, and uh, it's been going on for 10 years, and the court has been consistently monitoring progress of implementation. So it has, the presence of the court is increasingly there, but there is a decreased role, role of courts in, in that different parties are now coming together to set the dominant norms that has to be followed to fulfill this right. So it is not the court that is, it's not the court that is actually setting the dominant norms. It is the different parties that come together that are setting the norms. And I argue that what made this possible to happen was the key role that was played by the commissioners because they were the ones who informed the court of the, the actual status of implementation and they are the ones who made uh, communication possible between 28 states and a court sitting in New Delhi. So um, what does this say, for instance, uh, sorry, one of the, uh, one of the uh, instances that I wanted to point it out was, point out was with night shelters that I promised I would come back to. With night shelters, the court uh, basically did the same thing as any other policy. It asked for the status of implementation. The states gave out their affidavits, and it found that there was no implementation done. And it asked, uh, it passed directions for uh, the states to implement whatever policies they had. But if you look at the state of state, status of implementation of these orders, it's pathetic. None of the states have bothered implementing any of the any of night shelters. No one is constructing any. Uh, any more night shelters. And uh, one of the things that I, uh, when I interviewed some of the commissioners um, and uh, the campaigners, one of the things that I asked them was, what what happened with these orders? What did you do with these? And they said that we, we took these orders and went to each and every state government asking them what, what they were doing with this. And the first thing that the state government did was ask them, was tell them that we don't know who's in charge of something like land shelter. We have no idea. And this was basically a situation where the government, the state governments itself were not familiar with doing something uh, positive like uh, in, in the sense of building night shelters for uh, homeless people. So it was, so this sort of illustrates a situation where the court was acting as a, as a body that would send out uh, information as well as get uh, get uh, correspondence between different states on what was happening. 
with regard to the status of implementation. So I, I argue that there was the role of the court here was not so much as a, a, a rights uh, was not so much as a monitoring body, but rather as a forum where different parties could uh, could get together and communicate and set the norms themselves. So, uh, what is the role of the court in, in all of this? The first, um, the first function of the court, rather, was that it converted these abstract rights to specific measures of intervention. It, for instance, the court, in all its one key orders, did not bother to define what right who was and what entitlements it, it contained. It did not bother to have a normative discussion on what uh, the right of food meant. Rather, it it asked the government to respond and it got straight away into communication and building contextual uh, technical solutions to the whole uh, to the whole issue. And I think the right of food case also illustrates that with this kind of a strategy, the court can actually manage uh, to address a demand for a bottom-up movement. This is a Supreme Court which is sitting in, like, in Delhi, with, uh, monitoring 28 states. And it managed to hear a grassroots movement and um, NGOs working on the right to food movement. And I argue that this, this is mainly because of the role of the commissioners that made it possible for the court to hear about uh, the bottom up movement as well. And finally, uh, this sort of a strategy makes it possible for the court to uh, evolve some structural changes through an informed dialogue rather than just mere handing out directions in a rights and remedy sort of way. So, just as a conclusion, I, um, my main argument is that the court, uh, the main achievement of the court was sort of in stepping back from the rights and remedies argument that uh, uh, Tushnet and Landau uh, sort of argue on. I, I think the court did, uh, did something beyond this in the sense that it was not thinking in terms of rights and remedies rather than addressing how different parties could come together to set the norms themselves. And thank you. multi-causal, 
evolutionary. It encompasses individuals, organizations, and collective action driven by material, social, and ideological incentives. It morphs from one moment to another, seemingly at an ever faster pace. It resists our efforts to put it in theoretically derived and methodologically determined boxes. Can courts produce social change? Maybe, sometimes, for some people, for some period of time, depending on circumstances. It depends on what you mean by change. <laughs> <laughs> the challenge for scholars is huge as are the pitfalls for those who hope their scholarship will inform policy. And I think one of the interesting threads that runs through this scholarship is that the scholars involved are all interested fundamentally in the question they're researching. They care about it not just in order to produce publications, but because they're often themselves active in the political process and in the debate about what's the proper role of courts and public law. And it is indeed a huge challenge. How should we interpret the fact that Mrs. Rupert, the plaintiff in the historic case which Malcolm described to us, and which is quite well known, uh, involving uh, the South African Constitutional Court, uh, endorsing the right of citizens to adequate housing, how, how should we interpret the fact that she didn't have adequate housing years later when she died. How should we interpret the fact that Columbia HIV AIDS litigation led the Colombian healthcare system to the brink of collapse while bringing life saving drugs to the thousands of people who were living in AIDS? Should we look to the courts for social change or should we look elsewhere? And if so, where? And who is the weak in this question? I think a question that we don't ask often enough. So I think most of the colleagues, uh, certainly those who have presented, and I suspect many others in the room, we share a skepticism about what can be learned from the method that was not on display here today, which is building economic uh, econometric models that reduce the messiness of human behavior to a small number of measurable indicators and then rely on measures of statistical significance to try and identify what variables are of interest. What are these factors that actually determine, for example, whether uh, court judgments will have some kind of uh, impact. But I have to say that like my more quantitative colleagues, I do worry about the multiple interpretive constructs that we can apply to qualitative case study data. Um, because one of the things that I think comes out of these uh, papers and presentations, and I think most of the presenters were very self-conscious and, and made this clear explicitly, <coughs> is that how we interpret these stories um, really depends in a lot of ways on where we're coming from. That is, who the we is uh, in this story. The, the benefit of this kind of rich, holistic, qualitative method is it gives us much more information to draw on. The risk is that we move towards interpretations of the data that fit our preconceptions. And we have this problem, which Cesar didn't really have time to talk about, but he indicates quite clearly in his paper that whatever we might draw from the few cases that we studied, um, we have this problem that they never seem to be enough cases. So um, Everaldo is talking in some respects about one case, as I was talking about three cases. Malcolm had a chart that had a lot more cases, but however you think about it, it's never enough cases. 
right? Um, and so, um, what are we to make of that, all of this? How do we know what cases to select? What do, how do we know what kind of impact we should be paying attention to? I thought that was an interesting thread through these papers that everyone talked both about material and direct impact and about indirect impact, symbolic impact, political impact. But in the end, um, we still have this question of what counts as impact. And, and I thought Malcolm's uh, your selections from various people's commentary about social and economic rights just made that very vivid. Um, and then we have this more difficult question, if we can get beyond uh, those preliminary questions, which is really what all of this uh, research is trying to grapple with, is what explains impact. Um, is it, in fact, something about the process, judicial experimentalism, dialogic uh, activism, um, or is it something about the structure of the court itself and the structure that the court is embedded in? Is it really something about systems? I am hearing uh, Marsha's presentation I couldn't help but think that the court was playing a particular role in India that derives in part from the particular point in development of the governance system that India is in today. <coughs> and, and then how can we really draw um, broad conclusions from looking at the role of the courts in India, dealing with that kind of dispute, to moving to the courts in South Africa, or the court in Colombia, or indeed in Ecuador. Um, so I, I don't have a solution to these issues, but I think as all of us engage in this kind of research, um, we need to make ourselves think about the extent to which what we can be somewhat sure of is what we observe on the ground, on the one hand, versus the larger kinds of conclusions that we can extrapolate from our very different observations on the other hand. And I'm going to close with a somewhat different um, notion of how one might think about this research that was inspired by a conversation Sergio and I had uh, yesterday afternoon. So Sergio was sharing with me his research on um, arbitration in the business context as part of a long-term project in trying to understand um, what is actually going on outside the court system, an important issue that wasn't really addressed in any of these presentations here except the Chevron presentation. And he told me that he is working with a, uh, someone I would call a big data scientist colleague who is in the process of gathering from the web and multiple data sources of all different kinds, information about every decision seemingly involving some kind of arbitration tribunal or arbitrator, okay, and trying to, from all this information, understand something about developing networks, decisions, etc. So the thought I want to leave you with is that someday all of you, particularly our skills fellows in the room, who are young enough to, I think, actually be the beneficiaries or the victims of this, <laughs> you will be able to look 
into the world through the lens of the internet or whatever its successor is, and we'll be able to gather data about what every court is doing, what every lawyer is doing, what every NGO is doing, and how whatever behaviors are ongoing, and we will be able to answer the question of can courts actually produce social change? Thank you. Considering time, I think that like, instead of like responding immediately to Professor Hensler's comments, we can invite our panelists here and maybe accumulate a couple of questions and then have final thoughts. Also, you prepared. So, why don't you watch and here and then we open the door for maybe three questions, starting with Professor Freeman, of course. <laughs> water, 
housing into things that were thought of as inherent rights, which are taken for granted in the, in the first world countries, Denmark and all that. And so this is very, very interesting. It's a, maybe a little different way of looking at it, but I think very interesting and very important. And that's why I, I think that these are really, really good papers. And um, you know, I ask more citations. That's all. So it's not a question. <laughs> <laughs> the only question is, how did you, how, how did you all get so smart? <laughs> <laughs> so, what else? I agree with you both. And, uh, and I have a, a, a question for Cesar. It's a, it's a two-fold question for Cesar, and I have a comment about Malcolm's the presentation. So, so, so Cesar, the, of course, and, and this might be another paper, uh, but I think that when you look at impact and you look at the relationship between public opinion and, and the courts, and, and, and Deborah knows that I'm also not a binary person. I always, I like messiness, and, and, uh, and I actually enjoy it. And I'm not sure whether I want to find out I want Alex to explain this way, you don't mind staying in my apartment. <laughs> 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 yeah, right, right. So it's not only confined to scholarship. Okay. So, so anyways, when, when, you're, when I think about public opinion, and actually when I, the, the first session in my complex litigation course is how the, the impact of the media on, on, the, on litigation, and I look at it in a, in a more circular fashion, and, and the question for you is, is uh, as, as you look at public opinion, uh, how the court shaped public opinion. You know, public opinion after the 2004 uh, decision on the displaced people. My question is whether that public opinion that is formed in turn shapes the future behavior of the court, not only the constitutional court, this is the first part of the question, but the, 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 how, the, how lower courts rule in cases involving social rights. All the Tudelas, for example, in Colombia, I'm sure there, is a, there has to be an impact of uh, how people perceive their rights uh, and, uh, and how the courts, because judges are facing different types of pressure when everybody's talking about, when it's appearing in all the newspapers, and uh, judges are citizens to them, so they have, you know, it, it sways away how, how a judge reads the case and how a judge decides the case, and certainly how, how lawyers or advocates uh, plead the cases. Those are, those are the questions for you. And, and uh, regarding Malcolm, towards the end of your presentation, you compared litigation and non-litigation strategies. Uh, I had I recently done a, a case study on tobacco litigation in Brazil, and, and my, starting point, my starting point was that, and, and I did have this, okay, let's see what happened in the litigation, and let's see what happened outside of the courts. Uh, the litigation story was, was a very sad one for plaintiffs, because they have been losing in court consistently, year after year, there's a court ruling that is adverse to plaintiff, and I had an opportunity to interview plaintiff's counsel and ask them, outright, why is it that you keep fighting if you keep losing? You know you're never gonna win in court. They say, oh, you don't see the whole picture. We never thought that we were gonna win in court, but this is part of the larger strategy, because just by bringing the cases in the court, that raised public awareness that shaped the public opinion on these issues. So the, 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 the name of the game for them was to use litigation in a system of a larger strategy, and the larger strategy was to create social change. What they, what they achieved in, in, in Brazil, this is what the advocates claim that they have achieved, was if the government now pays attention to health issues. The government has issued very strict regulations against the tobacco companies. The tobacco companies don't know how to handle this because they were expecting that this was going to be a court battle and they've been winning in courts all over the world. But they were not expecting this multi front strategy, a very cheap strategy, because it capitalized on every single free resource and these plaintiffs don't have any money. But it's not money what drove them to, to, to go forward, it was, it was everything else. So, so I wonder whether the, the way to look at this instead of saying, okay, go, 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 instead of saying, okay, this is what you see from the courts and what we see from outside the court, to look at it as a bundle, because I think that activists or, or, or the parties 
sometimes look at it as a bundle, not really as a court versus non court. Do we have another question? So, say, sir, it looks to me on your chart, like your chart about the correlates of impact, that monitoring was the kind of key variable, at least in your examples. And that, I'm just wondering if Varsha and Malcolm think that's consistent with their studies. It sounded to me like for Varsha that monitoring was key. And then I just wondered with Malcolm if the absence of comparably elaborate monitoring was a factor in the limited impact in the media. Uh, in uh, South Africa. I think uh, I would not agree with you, uh, just to play for the devil's advocate, uh, uh, the country needs to provide, the political system needs to provide free education because uh, all politicians bring their political agenda uh, in academic institutes and uh, it impacts scholars on their uh, scientific research. Uh, and it got contaminated with a you know, higher form of agenda. So I think we have a need to uh, separate uh, state versus education like we have separated uh, the state as with uh, religion. So I guess we need more uh, separation between the state and education. I don't know. Yeah, I'm going to ask Thank you for the questions and the, the comments. Uh, as Deborah said towards the end of my paper, I, I do uh, sort of formulate the caveat that these are hypotheses really because of the small n that I'm working with. Uh, and now it, it's intriguing. I don't think I'll, I don't know whether I'm young enough or old enough to, or, uh, to see the future of big data, but uh, we're trying to use like, mm, Small data, but not as small as the one as uh, the three cases that I have with uh, some colleagues of ours, um, um, mostly Baron Gauri from the World Bank. We're trying to do a systematic study of the implementation of uh, socioeconomic rights litigation in, in Colombia. Uh, it's tricky because access to the thousands and thousands of, ca of cases that are being litigated for the world is, is hard. And now uh, he's actually doing a more systematic work with the University of the Andes. Hopefully that will yield some more sort of robust uh, results. The one good thing about this flood of mitigation is that it gives you a lot of observation points, right? So up to 500,000 cases per year, is it, is it what's the latest number? The total, yeah. Yeah, they mean, in all kinds of uh, rights. Right, so socioeconomic rights could be half of it, so 250,000, so you can do a good sampling with that. Um, but uh, certainly, so that uh, towards the end of my paper, I make, I make a point to be explicit about the hypothetical nature of, of, this, of this chart. And, and then, so the question that Bill raised is more for Barsham and uh, Mao, so I'll focus on Manuel. That's an, that's an interesting question. Uh, I, we didn't look at that systematically, but I think your, your observation is uh, on target in that, and, and with an interesting twist, because Colombia, like the rest of Latin America, does not have a stare decisis uh, doctrine system, right? So it's hard for the constitutional court, even a powerful, visible, proactive constitutional court, to get the courts, the lower courts, to comply with the type of approach that it's chosen to, uh, for these cases. So, and this gets talked about messy. It gets very messy because on the one hand, you have the upper courts trying to um, hand down structural injunction cases to make sense of this mess, to try to put some order uh, on this mess of thousands of thousands of cases on, on healthcare rights. On the other hand, you have lower courts that have not taken notice of that. Right, and continue to hand out individual, thousands of individual cases, which is partly what is based on the moderate uh, success and to, uh, to some extent uh, the failure of the court to permeate what goes on at the lower court level. So even if the court continues to systematically apply the structural approach, uh, it's sort of doomed to do that forever. 
right? Unless the government and the legislature do something uh, that structurally stems the flow of thousands of crimes and cases. But the media then becomes sort of the conveyor, conveyor belt uh, in, some, uh, in some, many of these issue areas, right? Because the court belt, they, some, many judges read the newspapers more than they read the, the, the upper court uh, rulings. So the technology is okay. Well, this court is, has an interesting case on IDP, right? So we should be uh, treating this differently. They may have read about the court's uh, decision on the healthcare rights. So I, it's a hypothesis. It would be worth the story. We haven't done that, but it could have a like, jurisprudential um, and institutional effect that uh, is not produced by, by the judicial system. There's a few things uh, uh, in there. I mean, firstly, your point about social rights. I mean, you take sort of very much a martial perspective. So the social rights growing up from the ground, sort of legislative rights, and then we have this new sort of constitutional rights coming in in, in a later period now, particularly in middle-income countries, um, but also in rich countries. So I think the US story is partly about constitutional rights. Most states in the US have the right to education in their, in their, in their constitution. Um, and in the last 40 years, in a number of US states, or quite a few, there's been litigation for that. So in New Jersey, there's been 28 cases on the right to education since 1972, leading up to around a billion dollars in transfer uh, to, to lower municipalities. So in Finland, would you believe, they put social rights in the Constitution in 1995, and there's been even litigation there, but not so much because you've got a social democratic state. So I think that even in the wealthier countries are part of the story, and do they change perceptions? There is one study, quantitative study, that shows constitutionalizing social security seems to have an eventual impact on the level of social security, but not other separate rights. But, you can take that how you will. With, with. But I think the issue in middle income countries is do you have enough countries really having the sort of responsive courts? Because that's where it's perhaps most needed, the, these constitutional rights. And what I found is, and I, I, I had an indicator for responsiveness, it's a very, very rough study which says that, so I need to refine it. But, and then I found that courts were most responsive in middle income countries with high levels of income inequality which to the Gini coefficient was my most significant, well, only significant indicator, pretty much, which seemed to suggest that there were many courts in middle-income countries that were responding to socioeconomic rights. And the Gini indicator indicated there were resources available, but they were not necessarily in the right hands. But at the same time, there was an equal number of group of middle-income countries which had high levels of inequality and very unresponsive courts. And so that's, that's, that, that, that's perhaps a, a, a challenge. Um, on the litigation and non-litigation uh, thing, that actually ties partly into Bill's question, because I think there is a question about what is the variable. Do we study judgments or do we study litigation? And, um, and a lot of the, the split of the US literature come partly down to that methodological sort of thing. What is the research object? And I think there's a lot to be said for saying let's look at litigation or legalization of an issue. And say, because that's what courts are. Courts are not just set up for, to do judgments. They're set up to receive claims, or just represent a, that a certain claim is legalizable and can be claimed with bureaucrats and others. So it's a whole shadow of the law going on, which uh, I could have got into. So I think that should be important. At the same time, there's a risk if you only look at litigation and you always endorse the policy of, even if we lose, we win because we win politically, if you lose a, a whole long string of constitutional court cases, you actually possibly take yourself backwards uh, legally because the bureaucrats, the politicians, are going to say, hey, you're making all these claims and the Constitutional Court says you've got no, no legs. So it's, the judgments do matter. I mean, this is going back to touch that uh, sort of point. So I think you can lose quite a number of cases and, and still have great impact, but there's a limit to that strategy. And I suppose that gets to, to Bill's question, is that I think that... In the South African case, it shows you can go quite far with a limited court by well, with legal mobilisation. But there's great variance then in, in the impact of the judgments. And I think the Hookborn decision is an example of where you could have had greater impact if you had a court that was more willing 
to have more responsive uh, remedies and, and, and judicial experimentalism and some follow-up orders. However, I'll just make a footnote on that, is that it's not just deliberative sort of uh, schemes or dialogical activism. There's one case which is fantastic which shows judicial creativity with a one-shot order. And that's the, um, the Modicute case. You've got 40,000 people occupying a white farmer's land, okay? And he says, you know, he tries to get, he gets an eviction order, successful, but the sheriff's not implemented because he's got to pay, you know, a two million, a two million rand in insurance. And so, what does the court do? In the end, the, the which is Supreme Court of Appeal that came up with the remedy, it says, okay, the property owner's got the right to the property. That's the right of the constitution. But these, these people are dwelling on the land. They also have a right to housing under the hookbook judgment. They can't be removed until there's an alternative accommodation. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, you can't necessarily evict these people um, until there's a turn of accommodation, but we're going to get the municipality to pay compensation for every day that farm is occupied. So bam, you've got a realist economic incentive for the municipality to give these people housing so they can stop paying compensation to the property owner. And what happens within two years, these people are moving into, into permanent housing. So judicial experimentalism can also be created in, in, in one-shot ways. Um, I don't think I have uh, very much more to say after, after this, but um, just in response uh, to um, the monitoring aspect of the, the case in the Indian Supreme Court, I think it was uh, uh, significant to a large extent put in court, um, but the court actually did not play a big part in actively monitoring uh, the implementation of its orders. It was more the commissioners who were actually looking at this. And the court, if you look at the court orders uh, after the commissioners reported on the status of implementation, it was basically verbatim whatever the commissioners said in the report. So the, I wouldn't say that the court as an institution, as by themselves, did any sort of a monitoring on this. But, um, and I, I also would be uh, um, hesitant to draw any sort of an impact of this monitoring because um, with the right to food case, a lot of uh, mobilization happened outside the court. A campaign came out of the, the, the case and the campaign did a lot of mobilization at the state level as well. So I would be, uh, I, I would uh, take a step back to sort of draw any sort of implications on impact of the decision, but I'm uh, looking more at uh, how exactly the, the court played a role in monitoring implementation. Okay. I think after four hours of symposium, it's time to end.